Queer Pedagogy Approaches to Inclusive Teaching. So before introducing you to the concepts of queer pedagogy, queer theory, maths and query, which all leads to the querying of the maths curriculum, I have a story here provided by Dr. Brandy Wade, a queer um, mathematician. And the story demonstrates us um, the many opportunities um, to learn from. And the question, or the story begins like this, uh, Miss Wade, how would you define a couple? And this was a question raised by one of her students and Brandy um, teaches uh, secondary school students. And it was in relation to a maths problem, typical maths problem, here it is. Um, at a school dance, there are X boys and Z girls, and there are more boys and girls, and how many different possible couples for dancing are there? And she recaps, this moment could have been an opportunity for my students and me to interrogate the assumptions in the mathematical book or textbook, assumptions that evolve from social constructs. I could have engaged the class in conversation about gender, suggesting that not all couples are heterosexual, that not all uh, individuals identify as male or female, and that a culture of acceptance is necessary. She continues, I could have prompted the students to see how they might solve the problem if they did not define couple as female or male. But she added, the moment slipped by because I was not prepared to queer the curriculum. She had set an assignment for students and realized then that they had not questioned traditional gender conceptions. Even though she was queer herself, she had not considered that students might question the definition of a couple. So hopefully after considering the content of this presentation and some self-education issues related to the queer community, you will be more prepared and confident to queer your curriculum and engage in discussion of queer topics in the classroom. This presentation gives a brief overview of the terms queer, queer pedagogy, queer theory, and mathematics in query, which all lead to queering the maths curriculum. Starting with the word queer, historically queer was linked with the terms insult and shame, and was, and in some cases still is, a term of abuse hurled at those who are perceived as not fitting into the norm, particularly at those attracted to the same sex. Today, the term can still be used as a term attributed to strangeness and difference. In the 1980s, it was reclaimed as an umbrella term in lieu of LGBTQ+, and is inclusive of people who do not fit, in the, fit within the LGBTQ labels. The term queer has become a rallying point, not only for the LGBTQ plus community, but also for people who wish to identify themselves with the anti-homophobic movement. Queer becomes everyone who is not normatively heterosexual. Queer is also used as a verb for questioning or troubling social constructs and what is considered normal. So if we look at the term queer, taking two different approaches, the approach under queer theory and the approach under liberal theory, on the one hand, queer theory proposes that sexual identity and gender identity is unfixed and may change over time, that um, identities are performative, which is about how we express our identity, the way we behave and so on because of this identity. And thirdly, that identities are tied to other identities, the race we come from, our religion, lack of, our social class and so on. And that identities are shaped by culture. In queer theory, the term queer is defined against what is considered normal or normative. We are questioning what normal is. 
And on the other hand, then, liberal theory sees identity as fixed or unchanging and is part of an essential self. Queer pedagogy seeks to uncover and disrupt hidden curricula of heteronormativity. It develops classroom landscapes and experiences that create safety for its queer participants. Queer pedagogy involves exploring being queer and how queer identities intersect and impact educational spaces. A teacher might use queer pedagogy to trouble traditional heteronormative notions about curriculum pedagogy. Queer praxis is active. It's concerned with the safety for our queer students and teachers. It encourages engagement of queer students. And finally, it encourages the understanding of queer issues, culture and history. So teaching queerly is not about teaching sex education. Queer pedagogy looks different in each instance. It will look different from discipline to discipline and even individually within those disciplines. Here's a snapshot of a conversation I followed on Twitter last year, and it shows some responses to a maths educator who openly stated that they didn't want to bring gender discussions into their maths lessons. Have a read through the responses and consider the issues this conversation raises for you. Queer theory arose in the 1990s. And according to Barker and Gile, it is a theoretical approach to question the categories and assumptions on which current popular and academic understandings are based. It questions what is considered normal, be it principles, laws, theories, theorems, social constructs, frameworks, people, disciplines, spaces, and so on. It is about holding ourselves accountable and always remaining self-reflexive. Taking a queer theory approach means trying to stand on shifting ground. You are never stable, never comfortable with the status quo, with stereotypical social constructs. Queer theory leads to mathematical inquiry, which moves beyond inclusion to inquiry in maths teaching. Kathleen Rands from the University of North Carolina produced a model of mathematical inquiry in 2009. According to Rands, mathematical inquiry recognises that mathematics is done by people, for people, people who drive how mathematical ideas are represented and who come with their own ideologies and biases. Many researchers and educators theoretically examined and documented the role of race, gender, sexual orientation, disability and colonialism in maths and maths education. Maths inquiry goes beyond the idea that maths is just maths. Maths inquiry moves beyond inclusion to inquiry in teaching and learning, moving beyond the tokenistic adding queers and star concept to interrogate normativity in mathematics, the classroom and outwards into society. Maths inquiry questions the tasks, the strategies, the very ways of thinking and doing mathematics as well as the way mathematics is used to interpret and act in the world. It challenges the assumptions of normal through questioning what we present to students in our notes, our assignments, textbooks and reference materials. Teachers and students question the nature of knowledge and learning 
and examine all facts and the context and assumption surrounding them. And finally, mathematical inquiry deconstructs and disrupts educational norms and allows us to imagine new possibilities in the world of maths. Franz proposes the following thought-provoking questions when analysing class materials, and these questions have also been adapted and adopted for interrogating other curricula. So the first question is, what do we notice or wonder? And let's say the student noticed or wondered about the term gender in the text. This can now be an opportunity to facilitate a discussion that helps the students define the terms gender and sex and distinguishing between the two. And this question also gives us a window into the student's initial thinking and engagement with the text. And the second question, what is the context? And it might take us uh, into the domain of the author's identity, the period in which the book was written, what was going on historically at that time. It's an attempt to get the students to question the tasks, the strategies and the ways of thinking. The third question, what genders are represented and how are they, how are they presented? Fourthly, who is included in the represented genders and who is not? What other genders exist? Again, these questions allow the student to consider representation in the text. They prompt the students to think outside the binary. Agender, transgender, non-binary, gender fluid, etc. And the final question, what would considering other gender identities, not just male and female, add to our understanding? And this question may prompt students to make connections between the text and the world they live in. It can also open doors to discussions on a broad number of real world issues. According to Rand's, queer inquiry or inquiry takes us from tokenistic inclusion of queer students and their issues into the extent frameworks to making a difference by challenging what is normal. True inquiry is not just limited to gender and sexuality. It's also about pushing back against society's idea of what is normal. For example, Rand suggests that students consider the normal way of measuring time and other ways there may be to experience or measure time. Another example looks at the notion of the family and challenges the students to question the types of family still left out of the problem. From a starting point of same-sex marriage, Rand encourages the students to explore and imagine relationship configurations that could potentially arise beyond same-sex marriage and the economic systems of income, healthcare, taxes, housing and childcare which could arise. Rand recommends four steps to develop a queer pedagogy. The first step is to reflect on your own identities and biases. The second step is to self-educate, to build up your own confidence. You might be more confident at designing and delivering curricula that are responsive to the needs of students from different cultures, ethnicities, religions, disability and race, and may lack confidence in addressing LGBTQ issues in the classroom. Take proactive steps to educate yourself on the lived experiences of queer students the terminology used within the queer community and ways to support queer students in the classroom. The first two steps might help you come up with ideas of how to queer your curriculum. The third step is to conduct a curriculum audit, or in other words, examine your course content. When conducting an audit of your own curriculum, take an item like a recommended textbook or some notes, or an activity and answer the following questions. Question one, are there stereotypical 
concepts or terms included in the text just because they're considered normal in social constructs, for example, male, female, race or ethnicity. Question two, reflect on what assumptions you have about these constructs. What do you consider um, as normal? Third question, in what ways has the text oversimplified the constructs? Fourth question, what other definitions or perspectives of the construct might exist? And number five, what does this mean for presenting this text to the students? And the last step is engage in inquiry. Just do the work. Maybe consider alternative examples, textbooks, discussion points, maybe introducing LGBTQ maths heroes and authors. So far, we've examined the term queer. We've looked at queer theory, queer pedagogy, and maths inquiry. And all this is leading up to the idea of queering the STEM maths curriculum. And traditional thinking has led us to believe that some subjects are more queerable than others. Subjects like law, politics, history, art, social studies and language provide many opportunities for discussion of gender issues and their intersection with race, ethnicity, social class, ableism and so on. And maths has commonly been viewed as a neutral, unbiased subject it's culture and value free. And it's considered by many people to be the least influenced by social um, factors. But critical maths teachers now recognise that what and how we teach maths are influenced by social factors and have hidden messages that often reinforce oppression. In my research for this presentation, I came across a blog from the American Mathematical Society. And the blog was written by Brian Katz, and it's a summary of presentations given by four mathematicians at an event called the Fields Institute's uh, LGBTQ Maths Day. And they write about queering maths and how their queer identities influence their work as mathematicians and educators. And as you can see here in the quotation, he said that his own work is also inspired by his experience as a queer person. I never fit into the implicit expectations for gender or sexuality as a young person. And that misalignment may be hyper aware of the systems that guided and structured human activity in general. In mathematics, this awareness served me well. I spent my time asking why we did what we were doing and how we knew the things we claim to know. More recently, I have come to see that I was lucky to happen into those habits in mathematics, buttressed by my other privileges. I see how students, especially students of colour, who ask similar kinds of critical questions are often driven out of mathematics when people assert that there is nothing to ask, that mathematics is just pure truth that they must accept. And even those who aren't driven away are forced to experience mathematics as a form of authoritarianism. So Ron Buckmeyer, a queer mathematician, kicked off the Fields event with a talk entitled Different Differences and he spoke about some of his identities which um, developed into an observation that some identities like race and gender are treated as standard differences and that other identities like his gay and Caribbean identities are often ignored. His talk centred on calculus-based methods and how continuous change is described using a limit of an average rate of change and this process can be discretized in multiple ways. Discretizing the most famous definition of a derivative leads to what is often called a forward difference 
but there's also backward or centre differences. And Ron's observation was that these approaches all implicitly assume that the width of the approximation h will approach zero linearly. And Ron demonstrated how we can reject this assumption by number one, replacing the role of h with more interesting functions that still approach zero on the order of h to get non-standard differences. And number two, by taking non-local discretizations as an approach to discrete difference modeling. Anthony Bonatti, another speaker, is an out proud and gay mathematician who studies the hidden geometry behind complex networks such as social networks and showing how these networks often reduce to a small number of characteristics or the hidden geometry. And this hidden geometry helps us to see the implicit social structures that non-queer peers might safely ignore. Anthony also studies axioms in relation to mathematics and EDI work. In mathematics, an axiom is an unprovable rule or first principle accepted as true because it is believed to be self-evident or particularly useful. Another talk given at the Fields LGBTQ Maths Day was given by Juliet Bruce, a trans woman who introduces her talk referring to the leadership of trans women in the face of transphobic and police violence uh, about 51 years ago. And Juliet brings tools from applied maths for computing with enormous matrices to algebraic and geometric classical maths to approach a problem from a new direction. And a link to the presentation is given in the references. So this example comes from Dr. Kate Lister, who is a lecturer at Leeds Trinity University in the School of Arts and Communication. And she was approached by a student when she was teaching a module on Victorian literature and culture. And she recommended the student read a book containing the biography of two trans women who lived in the Victorian period. And then a year later, the student turned up to her office and told her that the book had saved his life and that he'd wished to cross dress and was struggling with his sexuality at the time. He told her about his female alter ego that he had since developed. Now, although this example does not come from the area of maths education, I thought that its positive impact on the student was striking, given the no fuss step taken by the lecturer. And I think it's an action that could easily be replicated in the teaching of maths through the recommendation of non-stereotypical textbooks and LGBTQ role models. So there are many benefits of querying the curriculum. And the main ones, in my opinion, are that queer students feel that they are represented and it gives them a sense of belonging. And non-queer students learn to understand the diversity of the world in which they live. So instead of querying the whole maths curriculum, let's queer or question or challenge the term time. And going back to Rand's methodology, First of all, consider what is the norm or normal for the term time? And secondly, how is the term used in your maths textbooks? Or if you're teaching something else, um, go back to one of those textbooks. Include an example. And you might end up with some of the following and many, many more besides. And you can see you know, things that come to mind when you think of time, such as timelines, timetables, rules, structures, continuums, historical timelines, the way time is measured, analog and digital time, time zones across the world, learning to tell the time, different calendars, father time, we're bringing in a gender component here, warping, 
a little bit of Star Trek, linear time, non-linear, concepts of speed, acceleration, time to do stuff, time as a boundary, graphs, which you might meet in reliability classes, the bathtub curve, which goes through um, an infancy, mature or adult phase, an old age phase, and so on. And in this task, you might consider with your students querying the following term, family, and bringing in a mathematical dimension uh, to this task. So in conclusion, as lecturers, are we willing to go the extra mile and queer our curricula? Are we willing to seek out opportunities to do so? Are we prepared to engage deeply when the student asks a question which pushes against the norm, particularly gender and sex norms?